So now we're going to look at example 8.5 from the book where we're asked to design a T matching network um, where we want to transform an impedance of 60 minus J 30 ohms to uh, an impedance of 10 plus J 20 ohms. We haven't discussed nodal quality factor yet. Um, it's a very simple. So quality factor is equal to the uh, resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth. And there are quality factor uh, curves that can be dis displayed on the Smith chart. Um, so in SimSmith, you just enter your desired quality factor, and then the curves that show up correspond to that particular uh, quality factor. Okay, so a high Q corresponds to a uh, low bandwidth, and a low Q corresponds to a high bandwidth. Okay, so very simple. So when it comes to designing matching networks, if we are given a uh, nodal quality factor of a particular value, it just means that our impedance transformations have to stay inside uh, the boundary um, that's given by our particular quality factor. You know, so we can make a transformation down here, but we have to stop at where the, the boundary is. Okay. Okay, so here in SimSmith, you can see that I defined our load as the load impedance that was given in the problem. So that corresponds to this point here on the Smith chart. Um, and then I placed my star at the location of Z in, which is where we are trying to uh, transform our load impedance to. Make note that it's not the complex conjugate of Z in because there's no mention here of uh, maximum power transfer. We're simply trying to map one impedance to another using discrete, discrete components. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is recognize the possible um, rotations that you can make. Okay, so we can rotate upward like this, we can rotate downward like this, or we can rotate along the constant conductance circles like this. So the first step is to decide um, what path you want to take. So in this case, I decided to go with a series inductor. Um, so basically, the idea is that I can see that there is a constant resistance circle that passes through that star. And then I can see that there is an intersection between this constant conductance circle and that constant resistance circle. So I'm trying to make my way up to this constant uh, conductance circle. So that way I can rotate downward on this other constant resistance circle. So. You can see that there's a couple of different ways in order to get to this constant uh, conductance circle. One is this path here using a series inductor, and then another option would be to use a, a series capacitor and get down to the constant conductance circle down here. And I think the uh, the book um, takes that path, and uh, we'll look at that here in a second. So the next thing I want to do is rotate upward along the constant conductance circle. So that would, would, would so that would require a uh, shunt inductor. Um, so in SimSmith, um, I don't have SimSmith open here. I'm just uh, on my tablet. I don't have SimSmith installed on my tablet here. But um, in order to find these uh, inductance values that are required to make these transformations, you can either put your cursor right inside where the value is and change um, you know the numbers manually or you can put your cursor right inside where the numbers are and you can scroll up and down and so in this case if we were to do that with this inductor that would move our point here uh, up and down or another thing you can do is you can um, you can do it more interactively so you can right click on this point here and then you just drag it up and down so that's what I did here I um, you know I place a random inductor um, you know, so maybe it brought me up to this point, and then I, I would right click on this point and drag it, drag it up to this constant uh, conductance circle, and then SimSmith would do all of the work and tell me the uh, value of the inductor, uh, you know, required to make that transformation. Of course, you have to enter in your frequency of operation here, which I think in the problem is given to us as uh, 1 gigahertz. So, in order to make the transformation upward like this, same thing, I entered. I uh, inserted a, a random inductor, a random shunt inductor, and then you know the inductor is populated with just a, a random inductance value, so maybe it brings me to here. So then I right click on this point, and then I drag it upward to 
uh, where I want it to live. Okay, and finally, I see that my, my last step is to rotate downward. I know that's going to require a um, series capacitor. So I enter in a series capacitor, and same thing, I drag the point uh, to, um, you know, to where my target is. So here's our T network um, that produces a transformation from, uh, you know, this load impedance to our target impedance of uh, 10 plus 20J. So this is one possible route that you could take to uh, make that transformation uh, from point one to point two. Here's another possible route. Um, again, uh, we were able to accomplish this by using uh, first a series capacitor, and then a uh, shunt inductor, and then another uh, series capacitor here. So that would be option two. So you can see that I'm uh, numbering the the different options. There's four different options, so the, we've seen the first two so far. Here's another route. This is option three. So we can rotate up using a series inductor, then we can rotate downward like this using a shunt capacitor, and then we can rotate uh, up to the our target impedance uh, using another series inductor like this. So this, this, this would be option three. And, okay, so this was the option, uh, this was the path taken in the book here, so they started off with a, a series capacitor, then they used a um, shunt capacitor to rotate down like this, and then a series inductor to rotate up like this. So four different options. Um, so you might ask, how do you choose a particular option? The, um, you know, all four options perform the required impedance transformations from ZL to ZN. They all lie within the um, nodal quality factor curve uh, corresponding to uh, three. So how do you choose which one to go with? So what I did here was I, I modeled each of the four uh, matching networks uh, using LT splice, and I did a, an AC sweep from, I think, uh, 1000 hertz up to 10 gigahertz, just to show the frequency response of uh, each of the matching networks. Um, so you can see that they're all, they're all pretty different. One thing you have to keep in mind is that the all of these matching networks are in fact uh, different types of filters. So, and each filter is going to have a different bandwidth, uh, different frequency response, uh, you know, a different transfer function. So, which circuit you end up going with um, depends on the, you know the particular application. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is the concept of uh, broadband matching. Um, so there's another view in SimSmith where you can look at the uh, return loss seen looking in from the generator. Okay, so just recall from I think the first lecture that return loss is going to be equal to negative uh, 20 times the log of your input reflection coefficient. So the SimSmith, uh, if, if you click on this little window down here, it will bring you back to the uh, Smith chart. And then of course, like if I if I go back here, you can see that there's the plot of the um, return loss. Okay, so that's how you convert between the two. You just, um, you know, you click this little window down here at the bottom. So for this example, um, I'm using the, you know, the simplest possible matching network in order to match, you know, this arbitrary uh, load impedance to our 50 ohm generator. So you can you can see that just by using one component, it gives us a really good return loss of you know 48 dB at uh, at one gigahertz, um, which is more than enough. A return loss of 20 dB means that something like 97 percent of your power gets uh, transferred into into the network. So um, usually designers go for um, return losses that are um, at least 20 dB. Although this gives us a great return loss at our uh, center frequency of one gigahertz, um, if you look at the bandwidth here, uh, the three dB bandwidth, um, I think in this case is is around forty megahertz. So this is a, a pretty narrow band matching network. Um, if our goal was designed a was to design a broadband matching network, then the way that we would accomplish that is by adding more components. So you can see here I've added five components, um, 
I was able to achieve a, a, a good return loss of greater than uh, 20 dB. In fact, we're near 24 dB at our uh, center frequency of, of 1 gigahertz. Sorry, it says uh, megahertz there in the picture. And this is. And you can see that our uh, 3 dB bandwidth here in this case is around 340 megahertz. Okay, so there's a couple a couple benefits and a couple drawbacks of using these uh, broadband matching networks like this. So th I guess the first drawback is the fact that, um, you know, here we have the queue of our components, uh, or of our inductor inductors in particular, set to a value of 200. Um, that's a little high for um, high frequency systems. Uh, you know, I guess a more um, reasonable Q factor for the inductor would be, I don't know, around a Q of 50 or something like that. Of course, when it comes to reactive components, Q is going to be equal to the reactance divided by the resistance. So, so the Q value for a reactive component is a measure of its lossiness. So as the resistance goes up, the Q goes down. Um, so that's one drawback is that um, you know, in this example here, we're using five different components. Um, the Q values for the inductors could potentially be a lot lower than uh, 200, meaning that they're more lossy, which means that our uh, matching network is uh, is potentially lossier than desired. So you can hear, you can see here in this example that the um, the amount of power that gets launched into the network here is uh, zero dBW or one watt. So you can see the amount of uh, power that gets delivered into each component and how it's decreasing. So you can see by the time we reach the load, we're down, we're down about uh, a tenth of a dB, which which isn't too bad. But um, it's just something to keep in mind. Of course, this is with uh, the Q values for, of our inductors set to 200. Um, I didn't run the simulation with the uh, with with different Q values for the inductors, but um, so that's that's one of the kind of the disadvantages of going with these matching networks that are based on multi-components like this. So unfortunately, uh, SimSmith doesn't allow us, it allows us to vary the value of the, um, well, the capacitor in this example here by doing these a sweep, by turning the sweep on. And we could do the same thing here. We could set, you know, different ranges for our inductors and capacitors and turn these sweeps on. But unfortunately, the view that uh, results from this in SimSmith isn't quite the one that I was uh, looking for. But essentially, if you were to do this, if you were to do that type of suite, you would see that um, the center point of your return loss in this example would shift around, you know, our desired center frequency of one gigahertz. So you would see a bunch of overlapping curves here. You could see kind of what the best and worst return losses would be um, with the different uh, capacitance values. If you were to do that type of sensitivity analysis using just one component, you would find that you would have a pretty a pretty big range. I mean, I can't quantify it for you here just because I'm limited by, uh, you know, the capabilities of, of SimSmith. But, uh, you know, practically speaking, um, this type of network, it's like, you can see that it's very narrow. So, like, if it shifts left or right, uh, you know, you could potentially be it only has a bandwidth of 40 megahertz, so it doesn't take much for us to um, to shift off that center frequency and and cause our uh, return loss value to to decrease potentially quite a bit. But with multi-component networks like this, um, they're much more statistically reliable when it comes to you know that type of sensitivity analysis. So you can see that even if this curve kind of shifts around a little bit, I mean it's so wide that the kind of the best and worst case uh, return loss values um, is going to be a lot less. So that's just something to keep in mind when uh, dis when designing broadband matching networks. That also kind of suggests that uh, even for simple matching networks, you know, it, it might make sense even if you can even if you can match a, a particular load using one component, it might make sense to you know, make it a, a T network or a Pi network or something like that, uh, just so that it's more statistically um, stable when it comes to, you know, the sensitivity to the specific values of each of the components. So that's it for today. Um, 
Next time we will talk about um, impedance matching using microstrip lines.